Good afternoon and welcome to today's presentation, Cell Phone Forensics, Applications in Discovery and Investigations. The information presented by the expert is not to be used as legal advice and does not indicate a working relationship with the expert. All materials obtained from this presentation are merely for educational purposes and should not be used in a court of law sans the expert's consent, i.e. a business relationship where she or he is hired for your particular case. In today's webinar, Mr. Barley will discuss background, mobile forensics, typical cases, the forensic process, privacy issues, digging deeper, and the future. To give you a little background about our presenter, Simon Barley is a digital forensic examiner at Cal Forensics in Sacramento, California, which emphasizes in computer forensics, e-discovery, and fact-finding in support of complex litigation or referral for prosecution. He represents law firms, state and local government, high-tech firms, aircraft manufacturers, financial institutions, and school districts. He also has experience in obtaining and analyzing digital forensic evidence with specialist experience in high-level training in cell phone and mobile device forensics, cell tower analysis and presentation, digital tape archives restoration and analysis, and website and social media preservation and analysis. Attendees to require a passcode, the word for today is cell phone. During the Q&A session, we ask that you enter this passcode into the Q&A widget for CLE reporting purposes. The Q&A is located to the left of your screen. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must log on to your computer as yourself and stay for the full 60 minutes. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note that CLE credit cannot be given to those watching together on a single computer. Tomorrow morning, we will send out an email with a link to the archived recording of the webinar. The slides can be downloaded from the resource list at the widget at the bottom of your screen. Thank you all for attending today, and Simon, the presentation is now turned over to you. Okay, thank you, Lauren. Um, good morning or afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on where you are uh, across the country. Uh, this presentation, as uh, she stated, what is about cell phone forensics and applications in discovery uh, and investigations. Um, I'm from CaliForensics over here in California, and I'm going to first tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I, I'm English, even though my accent is slipping a little bit. Um, I come from an electronics background. Uh, I went to work for EDS, um, which was Ross Perot's rival for IBM, uh, embedded with the, the British Ministry of Defense, uh, doing safety and security analysis, and then moved to Prague in the Czech Republic to uh, build forensic search systems for intelligence agencies across uh, Central Europe. Um, since coming to the U.S., I, I worked a little bit in banking um, in turn with government accounts and fundraising accounts, um, and since then been trained by Celebrite to, to the top level for analysis of cell phones and mobile forensics. Uh, I work, I do a lot of criminal defense cases, a lot of public defender work um, that involves expert court testimony, as well as we do some large-scale civil litigation work as well. Okay, during this presentation, we'll, I'll try and cover a little bit about the background, a bit of general knowledge on digital forensics and, and why we might need it, what cases might need it. Um, a little bit about what mobile forensics refers to, uh, when we might need that, some typical cases, some little scenarios and different types of cases uh, that are of interest. Um, then a little bit about the forensic process, um, at what, what happens during collection, uh, the importance of preservation. There may be some, it might get a little technical, but there may be some terminology that may prove useful um, if you're getting um, a forensic report from the other side, and they mention certain types of extraction that might happen on a cell phone, that this will maybe help you know how, how whether a better uh, collection of data was possible and what that means. Uh, we'll go into some location data, some mapping, some cell tower data also, um, and then issues of uh, privacy, reasons for resistance, and a, a key case that, that covers um, concerns and, and what it means in a courtroom. Uh, we'll go into digging deeper, um, which will be little the extra services that we, we, we can perform. And, and if we have time, we'll, we'll go into the future and what we think will, will happen. Um, let's go dig into this. What is digital forensics? Well, a lot of people know what physical forensics uh, refers to. 
Uh, a lot of people watch mystery shows and uh, get to see the process. They, they're used to seeing people on site collecting evidence using clean suits so as not to affect the evidence during collection. Um, used to storing it in, in special containers to preserve the integrity of the evidence. And they used to uh, some sort of analysis, which in TV shows last, you know, get the result, the DNA of the killer within 20 minutes. But often, obviously, the reality is a little bit longer than that. Uh, and similarly with digital forensics, in the same way we have to collect the, the digital data from the device without affecting it in any way. Uh, people may be aware of something called metadata, um, which is essentially data about the data. So if you created a, a Word document, you know that it has a, a created date uh, attached to it and an edited date. Um, so even looking at a file can change some of this data. So the, the purpose of digital forensics is to collect that without changing the evidence in any way. Uh, we also have, just like physical forensics, we have a way of storing it uh, and maintaining the integrity uh, in a provable way so that if a case comes to court two years after collection, we can show that the evidence hasn't changed in any way. And similarly, with uh, the analysis, there's a lot of data on, on, on computers and especially the larger hard drives, so analysis can take a little bit longer uh, than you might think, even if it's a, a simple, um, simple case. Why do we need it? Okay, different reasons that, that cases and, and people need digital forensics uh, in general is evidence preservation. Um, the need to preserve things if litigation is expected. Um, this can be very important, um, not just because of sanctions, which we'll, we'll touch on a little bit, but there can, a great deal of data can be lost if it's not collected in time. So we're talking, let's say, uh, policy. Large organizations have policies of retention regarding emails that need to be noted. Um, obviously, cell phones uh, get damaged. People delete items. We want to make sure we, we go in there to, to preserve the data as early as possible so we have it saved. Um, and to maintain the integrity of evidence. So we preserve it, we have a copy, and then if, if the litigation takes you know, two, three years, it's still there, it's still stored uh, as in the same um, state as it was collected. Um, detailed analysis, we, find we can be hired to find user activity, um, people still copy files off their computer to take to their new employer and call the USB drive my stolen files. People still do that, those sort of things. So we, we can see that activity. We can see what was printed. We can see what was browsed. And that's a large part of what we do. We can recover deleted files uh, when people try and cover things up. But search for relevant evidence can be anything. Um, we've done reviews, especially of uh, cell phones, to show frame of mind. Um, so. It can be whatever uh, an attorney, whatever narrative he wants to present in court, we can try and find evidence to back that up, however circumstantial. Um, and obviously a cell phone is important in that because it, it covers a lot of day-to-day -day activity. So it can be used to show, not definitively, but it can help uh, back up a, a narrative about someone's frame of mind, whether they're happy or scared or, or what have you. Um, production of results. A lot of times civil litigation, uh, a strongly powerful written forensic report may be enough to, to push for a settlement. Um, the, the forensic results that we provide are, are meant to be reproducible and, and definitive so that if they hire an expert too and they read the report, um, there shouldn't be too many points um, to contest and, and can be enough to uh, move to a settlement. Uh, court testimony, we do a lot of that, especially criminal cases. Um, and then explain, and that can even be just explaining complex concepts to the court, uh, like Snapchat. Obviously, that to some people might not be a complex uh, concept, but uh, depending on certainly the age and sophistication of the judge, it could be, or uh, especially if it's a jury, not everyone will, will understand how different systems work. Um, I was recently in uh, family court explaining uh, the Find My iPhone feature uh, of, of the iCloud. So uh, that, that's part, part of what we do as well. Okay, moving into mobile forensics. What do we mean by mobile forensics? Well, it's forensics on mobile technology, um, and that covers cell phones, obviously, so that's smartphones, which most people have now, and not so smartphones. Uh, we do have a term 
that we use for people that use not so smartphones, and that, and that term is criminal, uh, which I feel bad about saying. Cause some people still still like the simplicity of it, but a lot of uh, people that want to hide their activity uh, use not so smartphones. Um, they're cheap. They don't carry a lot of incriminating data on them, you know, and they can be thrown away uh, at a pinch. So um, tablets. Tablets work exactly the same way as a cell phone. Um, the market was booming in tablets for a while when, cell phone, when smartphones were trying to get smaller. There was definitely a market for a bigger uh, thing, but now cell phones are, are now getting bigger. Um, but but there, we still deal with a lot of those in, in terms of theft of IP and, and, and criminal activity. Uh, wearables as well come under that. Uh, the, the smart watches. I don't know about Google Glasses. They haven't flooded the, the country uh, as they were promised to do at some point, but it's still something that we, we can see as a source of data to be analyzed. And moving on to the next slide, we see something else that, that, that moves on from the, the smart uh, devices into what's called the Internet of Things, which you may, may or may not have heard of. Um, and this covers uh, devices that connect uh, into, into a sort of a, a smart home network. This has come to the fore because of the rise of Alexa and Amazon's smart home uh, devices. And of course, now Google and Apple have jumped on that bandwagon. And all uh, manufacturers of products now are trying desperately to find a way or a reason to make their devices a smart device, uh, increase cost. But sometimes there's genuine functionality that's added there. But these can all be sources of data that we can use. Um, Thermostats, obviously, crop pots and the weird and the wonderful. They're actually, door locks. Um, there, were, there was an issue initially when they released smart uh, door locks that people would find, um, especially one-story houses. They would, their criminals would go to the back of the house to what they believed was the bedroom window and shout through the window, Alexa, open the front door, and it would unlock the front door. So they had to quickly issue uh, modifications to it to prevent the unlock. Feature. So you could lock your door through Alexa, but you can unlock it. Uh, I think that's now changed, so I, I don't know what security they've added to that. Um, but yeah, in a little bit that we talk about in the future at the end, we'll, we'll go into that, what implications that could have in investigations. When do we need mobile forensics? Well, it, it's, it really depends. Now cell phone ownership is, is well above 95% uh, of uh, adults in, uh, in America. Um, there's, a, there's that strong possibility that any legal case that you have, the, a cell phone will be involved in some way, whether it's relevant or, or in need of an expert. But it, it will be involved in some, some sense in a case. And with the percentage of that being smartphones on the increase too, mainly due to uh, drops in price, greater functionality, there's a lot, more, a lot easier to, uh, to do business on a smartphone now. So people are seeing more value in, in getting smartphones. So it's on the increase. And of course, the types of data it stores, it's more, more likely also that you, your case is going to involve uh, a cell phone. Um, I've left off criminal in this. I'll, I'll do some examples uh, of the activity we do in criminal cases. But um, most common types of mobile forensics case we're getting at the moment are inappropriate use of work devices. Which, which covers a lot of evils, as you can imagine. Uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, obviously a wor very worrying um, series of cases. And um, theft of intellectual property. Um, so we, we're going to go through a little bit um, of these scenarios and, and how, how we help, essentially. So starting off with inappropriate use of work devices. That can be uh, internet gaming. We, we have a lot of cases with that. School district recently, um, uh, IT director was playing multiplayer, you know, with those broad online games. Um, we w brought in to track the time of his use, and it was literally all day. He actually got to work at 7:30 in the morning, and he was already online and gaming at 7:45. Um, so we produced quite a detailed report uh, on that, so that supervisors could know what was going on there. Uh, pornography, as you can imagine. Um, large problem, uh, large reason for calling us in to investigate. Uh, we, we look into at viewing it. Were they looking at a website? Were they downloading it? Um, the amount of it on work devices, where, where it was stored, 
how much time was it taken up of their work or school day? Um, and, and the content can be important, not just because of uh, if it was criminal or not being ch child pornography, but even just inappropriate um, types. Like one example is a school teacher. I was recently uh, testifying at a teacher credentialing um, uh, administrative hearing, essentially, um, because a teacher was looking at teen content, though legal, had some worrying titles of uh, videos and things that, that were inappropriate, even if they weren't uh, illegal. So that's a lot of what we do there. And of course, child pornography plays uh, an unfortunate large amount of uh, our time in terms of investigating. Um, we, we tend to search for known uh, CP images, child pornography images. Um, and I'll tell you in a second how, how we do that. Um, we check the hash values. Again, I'll, I'll tell you that in a moment. Um, we, we search how it was viewed, well, if they used an external drive, so we can provide that for a search. Um, and these always result in law enforcement um, being brought in, even if it's a side effect of uh, an employment law case, um, you know, civil litigation, we find uh, child pornography in any way, uh, we, bring in, we bring in law enforcement. But just to explain um, how people know that an image is, is known child pornography and a little bit about what we do. This is a slide that explains, uh, well, it doesn't quite explain yet, but uh, what a hash value is. And now this doesn't look like it, but this is the most important part of um, digital forensics as a whole. Um, so a hash value, this hashing is a, a process whereby um, all the ones and zeros of a uh, either a file or a drive, are put through a complex algorithm to come up with a long, complex number at the end of it. If we look at the MD5 one there, these are two different protocols, two different algorithms, essentially, two different equations that generate uh, unique answers or semi-unique answers. Um, and so this is an answer essentially to, to what is this file, the contents of the file. It doesn't affect the um, name of the file or the metadata, as I previously mentioned, but it's the actual content. Um, and if anything changes on that content, it comes up with a different answer. So these are the, the hash values of this presentation. Um, so if I was to, so I could rename this presentation whatever I wanted. I could um, change the author of it. Uh, you know, that's listed in those little properties. But if I even put a blank space next to the uniques, yeah, uniquely identifies data part of this, it will come out with a different number. And this is how um, digital forensics um, preserves that um, integrity of the evidence, too. So when we take the forensic collection, um, the forensic software or the tools will, will hash the entire drive of the computer or uh, cell phone sometimes um, to, before it does copies the data over. So it will have a hash value for the, the drive itself. Then after the extraction or the copying of the data, uh, it will scan and hash the forensic image and make sure it comes up with the exact same um, number or hexadecimal number. It's actually in, in base 16 in hexadecimal. So that's how we know it's an exact copy. That's also how we know things, uh, whether anything's changed or corrupted. Um, it's also how uh, antiviruses work, especially the older ones. They have a series of these known uh, virus files, and they have the hash values. And they, search, they hash your machine, and they, they look for matches. So it doesn't matter what the file's called, whether it's tending to be a Word document, um, it, it can identify them. Um, so that's what, it, what it's used for. And, and in um, child pornography, is when law enforcement identifies a, a victim that's shown in an image, they will save these hashes. And uh, we can download these hash values to search our data. So, so that's a part of what we do in an investigation. We can see whether there are there any matches to this database of these identifiers. Um, and and that's, that's part of what we do for uh, child pornography cases. Um, sexual harassment in the workplace. Now this, I would say a large portion of uh, our investigations um, into this um, 
seem to be valid allegations and, and um, the evidence we find large portion of the time back up um, the claims. But this this is a specific incident um, of a false claim that, that happens all the time and it, keep, it keeps coming uh, back to it. So I, I, it's an interesting one, so I, I, that's why I included it in this. Um, it's actually a case where a supervisor, person one, um, and uh, a subordinate are having uh, a relationship with, with one of them or both of them uh, being married. Uh, it's a common scenario, um, very consensual. They, they have um, a conversation by a text. Normally, it is a little bit more. Um, the, the, the example I have up here is a little bit Sesame Street, so I apologize. But they're, they're the ones I normally see uh, do, do make me blush a little bit. But for the purpose of this demonstration, um, I've done a quite, a quite a normal one. Um, conversation between them that, that seems innocuous. Uh, it's, we're going to have a copy of this entire conversation that's going to be on, on the supervisor's cell phone, as well as the exact same on the subordinates. So what happens is they, they get on very well, they have their relationship, and then it comes to an end. Um, the person one may be married the, or, or just feeling bad because of he's the supervisor, us, please, let's just delete all our communications. You know, this was wrong, we shouldn't do this. So um, person one deletes the entire conversation. But person two doesn't, they keep it. They don't delete the messages. Uh, and then at some point in time in the future, they are reprimanded or even let go by the company that they file a sexual harassment claim. And then they produce as evidence a selection of messages that doesn't necessarily show the whole picture. So again, forgive this crude example, but you can see how you can twist by choosing which messages you provide. Um, you can change essentially the narrative of the case. So. We get a lot of these. It's a surprisingly common uh, issue. And then we have to uh, try and recover. Um, we, most of the time, we won't recover all the messages, but just enough to counter um, sworn testimony by person two on the case, and just to challenge that narrative. Um, and so there's a, I show a little bit of evidence later on of, of a case like that, where I managed to find a message that countered um, her sworn testimony. So that, I've included that. It's a very common one and, and goes to show what we, we get asked to do quite a bit in terms of recovery of text messages. Theft of intellectual property, a huge, often huge uh, civil uh, cases, a lot of problems there. Now, um, Strauss Freeberg um, did a survey, um, uh, quite a broad survey that, that had some quite startling results. 71% uh, of the respondents admitted to uh, frequently or occasionally sending materials to a personal email account or uploading materials to a personal cloud account, Google Drive, things like that. Um, most cited reason, at, at close to 40%, was they preferred their personal computer over their work computer. They were asked to you know, work at home. Some of you may have done that. It um, can be quite a natural thing. Um, oh, I'm just going to you know, send this to my, my Gmail account so I can just work on it at home. Um, and, and that, that can be a huge, huge issue uh, in terms of trying to deal with that when, when they move to a competitor. Um, the 51% of senior management admit to taking job-related emails, files, and materials with them when they've left past employers. That is a lot more worrying because obviously they have access to a lot more uh, sensitive and proprietary information that, than, than the people below them. Um, the HR best practice we say is we should there should be forensic imaging of devices upon especially key personnel leaving the company. That is very difficult to fight for um, from a cost and uh, logistics um, standpoint. But you know the problem that we encounter a lot is when when they only find out that um, even with sexual harassment claims, HR departments only find out after the person's left and probably a couple of months after. Uh, a lot of the time that, that something's happened or, you know, the clients clients are getting called from this new company. Um, and by then, the devices have probably been reallocated. Um, they used computers, sent it to someone else, they've wiped it, they've reset the phones. Uh, and so that is, that is the ideal, uh, especially for key personnel, to keep that preserved 
forensic image, the snapshot, the exact um, set of data from that device. And, and then once it's been forensically imaged, it can be reallocated, reused. It doesn't matter. We have, we have a court-approved uh, exact copy of, of that data. Um, let's go through a little bit the, the forensic process here. Um, what steps should you take upon receiving evidence? It may or may not happen that you yourself um, receive evidence. A lot of times that may happen with a cell phone because it becomes aware that it might be relevant and, and uh, clients may drop it off uh, for collection. Uh, it's important to, if, it, if the device is off, leave it off, or if it's on, don't turn it off. Just keep it on and place it into airplane mode. Uh, that will help uh, prevent any updates, any operating system updates, uh, app updates that may alter the evidence. May, and it prevents someone doing a remote wipe, which is a, a huge issue now. Um, Find My iPhone is a feature on the iCloud that you can go in from another uh, Apple device with the same Apple ID and then and remote wipe um, your phone. So that, that could happen. So to prevent that, um, it's, we need to get it into airplane mode. And that little picture is what's called a Faraday bag. Uh, named after Michael Faraday. Um, it blocks all signals um, to the outside, either Wi-Fi or, or cell network. Um, I'm actually a user of uh, T-Mobile cell phones, so there's lots of places around Sacramento that could be described as a Faraday um, device because I can't get any signal uh, in a lot of those places. But um, we, we put, whenever we get a cell phone in, we'll put it inside one of these uh, Faraday devices and it will still uh, sense your touch on the screen so we can, we can power it up um, without it connecting to a network and then place it into airplane mode. Um, law enforcement has a huge issue with this, with people handing over their powered down cell phones to a, a law enforcement. Uh, they then go back, the, the officer takes it back, logs it in evidence, keeps it there. A week later comes to say, oh, I'm gonna get, extract all that data, find out what happened and the, the uh, suspect has gone onto a computer and remote wiped it. And before, if it powers on and it will hit that network or your Wi-Fi before you can get to airplane mode and it will be wiped, all the evidence will be gone. So it's a, it's a need and a precaution to, to use these kind of uh, devices, these blocking devices. Uh, make sure we get passcode, password information. That can be a problem if you're compiling devices from the other side. We need to make sure we have that updated information and um, that we can test it and make sure it works as soon as possible so that we're not chasing them down later in the day trying to get the right uh, password and backup passwords and passcodes. Um, and, and step four, really bring us in a, a, as early as you can or, or you're, you're anybody with uh, forensic training as soon as you can um, to even help consult on how, how to deal with these devices because it can cause improperly collected can cause damage and, and, and data loss. Could, speaking of data loss, yeah, mobile technology is, is very volatile, way more, the most volatile really of, of um, digital data. Uh, can be lost by user selective deletion, like we said, messages um, and, and images. People, when they take their cell phone in to be introduced into a case, um, either to the other uh, the opposing counsel or to their attorney will often go in and try and delete messages they're embarrassed about or it doesn't make them look good or they think will be misinterpreted. Um, so that, that could be a huge issue. But even things like app updates can damage it. Um, Snapchat had um, some bad publicity a little while back because it, it got out into the public uh, mindset that uh, Snapchat left forensic artifacts for people like us to to find, and, and it was very damaging to what Snapchat was trying to market their app as. Uh, so they've, they've worked pretty tirelessly to update that, and the updates delete the any uh, forensic artifacts that were there from the previous version, and now prevent um, there being any, any real artifacts left um, by, by the Snapchat. Um, Constant OS updates, similar things that can be logs and data that are overwritten and, uh, as the OS, the operating system changes. 
So that, that can be something where if you leave the phone too long, data can be lost. Factory reset, simple and effective, um, can be an easy way. But we do get a lot of people that accidentally drop their phone on the way to, to bring it in for collection. But a lot of times, sometimes they just reset it. Um, and, and as we mentioned, remote wipe can be a problem. Um, deleted data. Now, if the people do delete things, you might say, well, you can recover deleted items. Um, there, there's some reasons that it might not be recoverable. Um, the main one is security on the device. To get at the, the, the deepest level of data, uh, we have to use imperfections in the code and uh, known vulnerabilities and problems with, with the coding. Um, and their security team for Apple and, and other devices are constantly working to fix those and keep us out. We're essentially hacking into the device's memory to get all the data we can. And, and so it's a constant battle. So if there's a security update on the phone that's done, it can be the same model phone. If one's just got a different, more uh, a newer security update, we may not be able to get uh, as much data as we should or, or we need. So that can be a huge problem. The other is a slightly less exciting sounding, uh, wear leveling of NAND technology. So uh, forgive me and be patient with this, but it, it is an important um, problem because with the older technology of computer disks and the way it's stored uh, data in, on hard drives, it would essentially stay there um, marked as deleted until it was written over. And this, that, that could be a relatively long period of time with the newer technology that use what's called a NAND chip. Um, now this covers solid state drives we may have heard of, um, USB flash drives, and cell phones and mobile technology. They all use the same type of uh, memory chips. Um, and the way, what happened initially when this technology was developed, they, they did it for um, these flash drives, the USB drives that you have. And they were designed to, to basically work for about 10 years. Um, of constant use. And initially they found out that, that they were failing within in under a year because as the crude little graph at the bottom uh, kind of shows, the same little parts of the area uh, of the memory were being written to constantly and the rest was relatively unused. So they realized they had to put in a little bit of a, a, a controller attached to it essentially um, that would move data about and make sure things are written equally to all parts, and, and to spread to the level the, the wear and tear of the, the memory. And that, that constant moving about and making sure the entire bit of the, uh, the chip is used is obviously going to uh, overwrite deleted data um, a lot quicker uh, because of that. So that, that, that's a big problem. Uh, we do have a, quite a limited time frame for um, recovery of deleted data, you know, can be, you know, two to three months, can be a lot shorter, can in some cases be a lot longer. It really depends on, on how much use is uh, on the phone um, since the point of deletion. Um, that, that can be an issue if it, it's a teenager that's using all kinds of apps and doing things. It's probably going to be a very short um, lifespan of that, that deleted artifact. But, uh, yeah, that, that's one of the problems that, that we see. In terms of preservation, uh, I've included this, the, the Federal um, Rule of Civil Procedure, which governs possibility of sanctions based on um, loss of uh, evidence that should have been preserved. Um, it's been loosened a little bit now uh, as to intentional loss rather than just negligent loss. They've tried to be a little bit more flexible now than when it first was um, issued, but it covers the loss of destruction of relevant uh, cell phone texts. I've, I've included it for that reason here, but it, it basically says that the electronically stored information, or ESI, uh, should be preserved. So the court can issue sanctions if uh, these four conditions that I list there uh, are met. So basically that the, it should have been preserved in anticipation or conduct of litigation, that it's now gone, um, and the loss is due to, to one of the parties' failure to take reasonable steps to preserve it. Um, and the last one is a little bit of a uh, savior for some, some cases because it, sanctions will only happen if there is actually a, a detrimental effect to, to one of the side's cases because of it. So if, 
like a text message was sent by one person to another party. The sent text message was no longer there, but they were able to get the message from the recipient. Then sanctions can be avoided. But it's a, a key issue, especially with the volatility of uh, the data on there. Um, and I apologize for the the, the novel uh, of a slide I, I have here, but um, just to go through this key case and definitely uh, look up this case and, and read about it. It's an interesting one. It's um, a sexual harassment lawsuit was brought, uh, brought um, basically a wrongful um, dismissal. Uh, the the plaintiff. Uh, wrote uh, essentially a log, and this happens quite often in sexual harassment cases that, that we see. They, they kind of journal the incidents and inappropriate act, uh, acts uh, that have happened in some sort of uh, computer file. Um, in this case, she, she wrote it on notes, and then she wrote it up into a, uh, a log file on, on the computer, on her uh, computer she had. Every night uh, there were audio uh, recordings and text messages that she wanted uh, included. Now, the problem happened was the fact that the notes that she made were uh, thrown away after she copied them into the computer file. Uh, but then she threw away the computer, uh, so she no longer had that. As part of the case, she actually she created a log from memory, uh, which, as you can imagine, causes some, some problems. But um, it, what didn't help actually was that she, when asked about the the disposal of the computer, she said, "Well, she got a new computer. This one was um, was old." And she was asked whether it was uh, the change of computer happened before the start of litigation. Uh, she said it was, but they they kind of pushed and compelled credit card records and, and proved that it was after the the in, initiating the the litigation. So that damaged her the case a little bit. They, the other side brought um, sanctions, uh, applied for sanctions against for, for loss of um, the computer, the log of harassment. Uh, she had text messages, but they, they were screenshots and printed out. She uh, disposed of the cell phone, uh, so they didn't have that. But that was part of the uh, sanctions that were, were applied for. Um, and, and so the judge said that this was, was correct, granted adverse inference instruction. Um, to the jury as to the plaintiff's computer, the log of harassment that was gone, because no, she didn't copy it off to another. She didn't put it on a USB file before getting rid of the computer. It was gone. Um, the cell phones, obviously, because a, a screenshot printed out of a, cell, uh, of a text message doesn't have any other data about the timestamps. It can be altered by you know, simple Photoshop if need be. Um, and she had audio recordings, but they, they, they didn't really have... Um, any dates. So, uh, and there were other recordings that have since uh, been deleted as well. So there was an adverse inference instruction there. Um, was not allowed to in introduce the screenshots, the text messages, all the audio recordings, and of course she had to then pay all the, the fees, the other side defendants' fees for challenging this and the uh, motion for spoilation. And uh, there's another motion to compel that came out of it based on emails. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting case about, um, interesting because of the, the importance of preserving that evidence. It's important because they, they determined that her duty to preserve the evidence started with her starting that log of sexual harassment, which is very interesting. So if you have a client or there is a, a case of uh, sexual harassment where a log was kept, that, that has to be preserved. Once you start that, um, that, that's when the duty to preserve begins. So that, that was an important one. And it's important because of the, the, um, uh, the, the being prevention of introducing the screenshots of text messages. That's very important. And as even in family law, um, it's getting the sophistication of the courts is getting to the level where they, they're, they're starting to reject that kind of collection of um, digital data because they know there's a better way and an uh, easily accessible way to uh, get that data for review. Um, but it's an interesting case. I definitely recommend you, you look at that for, for uh, relevance. And I think we're ready for our first session of uh, questions. If Thank you. We are now in the first Q&A. Present to the passcode now. The passcode is cell phone. 
The first question that we have is how long do cell phone companies store GPS data on a phone? Oh, okay. Um, I'm actually going to get to that. I, I, I do have a, a, a slide uh, in a moment that breaks it down. Um, AT&T is the best. It keeps them for seven years. It, it ranges from um, a year uh, to 23 months through to seven years. I, I have it broken down on the slide in a, a little while. Um, yeah, it, was, it came from a question from a, a public defender's office because often they get a, a case and it's already a year after the event. Um, so they very much have to move very quickly to try and get that. Um, but yeah, I have a slide. It, it varies quite, quite a lot. And I also have it, um, oh, and GPS data. So that's it. They have a timeline for three different types of data. One subscriber data, which is relatively quite short. Um, there's the cell tower call records, which is what number was called and the location. The GPS data itself tends to be six months and it is only as I, I'll, I'll touch on in a little bit, um, is protected. So it has to have a court or a search warrant, essentially, to get that access to the GPS data. Great. We have time for one more question. Can we get data from phones that are broken, touchscreen not working, or when it is involuntary, phone locked? Um, OK, yes. Well, yes, I can do, depending on the phone. Um, there can be ways we can, uh, in the digging deeper section, we can, we can go through and uh, sometimes take the, the memory chip off, that NAND chip off. We can put it into a similar uh, phone. If it's just the screen, we, we can do some replacement work there. Um, the memory chip we can, we can take off and have a look in a, a reader, depending on what it is. The newer Apple phones are, have encryption on the chip itself. So we take the chip off. It doesn't matter. We, we can't really get access to it. Um, phone lock, we can bypass the uh, passcode on certain uh, cell phones. Obviously, the new uh, gray key device will, will bypass um, all the new, newer iPhone apps. But in, in general, up until about the iPhone 4, we can do it here. Anything newer than that, we can send it away and, and get access to that data. Uh, the reason we send it away, a lot of companies will hide the technique because if Apple finds out about the technique, they will uh, fix the vulnerability that allows it and, um, and then you know, the party will be over, as it were. Um, but yeah, we, we can bypass a lot of um, security. It really depends on the make and model and how new it is. So definitely ask your forensic provider um, you know, just say, can, can you bypass a uh, passcode on, on this uh, Galaxy S6, et cetera? Thank you. That was all the time. We have questions right now. You can continue on with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I'm going to move through a little bit um, quickly here. This is just some of the terminology that you might encounter. Um, types of extraction we get, logical extraction, that just gets the active files on the device. No deleted data. It basically asks the cell phone, what text messages do you have? What images do you have? Basically what the user sees. Uh, and that's the easiest one to get. Um, file system extraction is very similar, but it gets a lot some of the system files in there uh, that may prove useful, some logs, et cetera. Generally do a combination of those two. The iPhone uh, has, it's called an advanced logical extraction. It basically, essentially is an iPhone backup, but it, it asks the operating system uh, for all its information, but it, it's a very helpful operating system. We get a lot of deleted data, uh, and uh, there's a lot we can do with that. So it's quite a good extraction. And that's the most common one, because we get a lot of iPhones. Um, our goal is the physical extraction. This is all ones and zeros on the memory chip, a lot of deleted data. Um, more likely on an Android iPhone 4 and earlier, as I say. And to get there, we bypass all the security on the device. So it bypasses the passcode. So if we can get past the passcode, we can get all the data on the chip because we're bypassing essentially the security of the phone. Uh, but the physical extraction is the best extraction that we can get. Um, so that's just some of the terminology you might see on a report or uh, from your forensic specialist. Um, data types. This is an example screenshot of, of what, how um, 
mobile forensic software parses out the data, reads through all the ones and zeros, and then groups them all together for us here. The uh, number in, in parentheses in white is the total count of, of these items. The one in red is how many of that is deleted and been recovered. So you, can use, you can see there's quite a few, quite a lot of deleted data. I think this was an LG phone um, that, that uh, used as an example. Um, chats, contacts, device locations, uh, users, passwords sometimes give us a key. They're normally, what's saved on the phone is very um, frivolous is the word I keep thinking of, um, save passwords. So it won't be anything severe like uh, online banking or anything that's saved on the phone uh, unencrypted, but it may be some sort of app or uh, mailing list you know, registration. But what you can, uh, we can look at is if the person keeps using the same password, that it may be that um, that password was used for a backup or a login to a, a, a GroupMe text app um, that, that we can maybe access. Um, so if we, you can see a broad range of data there. If we expand it out a little bit, you'll see chats. We'll get uh, some Facebook message uh, chats. Now Snapchat, this, this was an older version of Snapchat, and we still didn't, um, we weren't able to recover pictures through, directly through this. So you, if you use Snapchat, your, your secrets are safe. Um, but we did get some information regarding handle IDs, uh, which, which we used in a recent case, this home invasion case. Um, and it was, um, the uh, defendant said it was actually a drug deal gone wrong. Um, so you know, obviously not an angel, but um, we were tasked to look through these handle IDs to try and find the handle ID of the, the alleged victim of the home invasion to prove that they, they knew each other uh, prior to the incident. Uh, contacts, we can break out all of these. All the weird and wonderful uh, chat applications that are changing daily. It's a constant battle to try and find out what people are using now. And it's not obviously something I can just search for. I really don't want to have to Google how are teens talking uh, online. You know, I, that's not something I want in my Google search history. So, um, but we do have to know what about all of these apps that we may recover from a device. Uh, locations, as say, lots of sources of locations there that we can use. But uh, I want to move on so we can get to to some of the the more useful uh, ones. Uh, instant messages, we can pull out Twitter messages, searched items still trips people up. Um, people still search like how to steal from my boss, you know, how, how to hire a hitman. People still still do it. Um, and uh, we can recover those, all types of different searches. Um, this little file structure we I included because in a case it was very important. Somebody had downloaded uh, an app that saved Snapchat photos. Um, they were sent a lot of uh, very personal images from from ladies. And he downloaded an app that saved it, but he didn't realize that it automatically saved uh, photos uh, he'd sent to his best friends, his most common uh, snapped uh, friends. And it was actually a murder case, and, and it was 10 minutes before the start of the murder uh, time frame. Um, it saved a, a Snapchat photo he'd sent of him pointing the gun at the camera uh, that was used in the, in the crime. So uh, it can catch people out. Um, so we, we do a bit of in-depth uh, poking around there to see what kind of apps people have uh, added in there. Uh, but this is kind of the data that we'll get off a cell phone. Um, SMS, you'll see the little X's if it's been deleted. Uh, it'll show us that. Chats, um, as you can imagine. Oh, let's see what happened there. There we go. Um, it'll break down in a little conversation format. We can see there that on the middle um, message, there's a little icon there that shows we've got a location for that person. Um, so that, that can be used. And we break that down in our reports to, to go and show what the conversation looks like and, uh, and its content. Email and Snapchat, limited content. Yeah, phones don't do very well with uh, email. You end up, essentially, you're logging into um, a server like Gmail. So there's better ways to get the email data request username and password, we can collect that. We can use what's called the triangle agreement, which I'll talk about in a, in a, in a moment, to protect privilege and, and non-relevant data. 
but yeah, don't expect uh, email from, from the cell phone, per se. There's other ways we collect that. Uh, images. You used to have a lot of metadata on, on images. Um, and you can see here, even on the right there, it says MD5 has the number there. It's got the hash of that image. Um, don't have any location data nowadays by, by default. Um, social media strips off metadata and location data to, for, to protect privacy. And so cell phones tend to be going towards not even saving that. So most people use their, their camera for um, uploading to social media. So not, not the source of information it once was. However, we still do get information where it gives a, a, a longitude and latitude there type of phone it was taken on, resolution. Um, we, we still do get some, uh, some cases where, where that's actually available to us. And we can track locations that way. Uh, other way to do it would be power data on the device. This, this was the, the old uh, cell network, the CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access Network, that is now defunct. Uh, if we get in a cell phone where this data is stored on there, maybe it's an old case, there's still databases we can go to and sort of map out these cell towers. But um, I'm going to skip over that to get to what happens actually nowadays, which is with the GSM communications. The cell network stores call records and SMS data, um, records location whenever there's incoming outgoing calls or SMS messages or whether uh, if someone's using their data to connect to the Internet. There can be location there. can be obtained via subpoena. It's not protected data. Um, and this is an example here, United States versus Davis, um, said it was not a violation of Fourth Amendment right against unreasonable search and seizure, even if um, records place a defendant's cell phone near a crime scene. So there's no expectation of privacy if you're dialing in a number and sending those numbers to a third party, as long as the content isn't shown. Um, that the content is protected, but the, the numbers to and from and the location are, are not protected. Um, Verizon, I've got the dates here for you for subscriber info, 7 to 10 months a year with Verizon, 23 months, 18 months for Sprint, 7 years for AT&T. So we like AT&T. Um, so we deal with their, their compliance department quite often in, in getting records and asking to explain certain aspects of it. Um, so yeah, definitely download the presentation to keep that slide if it's pertinent to your type of cases. Um, what we get with the cell, uh, the call data, we'll get the connection date and time, the number to and from, the IMEI number, which is the, the equipment ID, the handset, essentially, the cell phone handset, uh, and then the IMSI, which is the subscriber ID, which essentially is the, the SIM card. So uh, you can have different IMSI numbers with the same IMEI number if you've switched out uh, SIM cards but it's a good way to identify the actual phone itself. Description, and the example underneath is SMS terminating. So the, the example here was uh, an incoming SMS message. Uh, make a model of the phone, and then the cell location data. Now this has an identifier for the cell tower, as long, uh, along with a longitude and latitude uh, coordinate, and what's called an azimuth and a beam width. And if we, we go to the next slide, we'll show how we, we map that. Um, so obviously we locate the tower using the um, longitude and latitude. The azimuth is the angle from north round to the center of the beam, essentially, that either transmits the SMS or the call or receives it. And then the beam width will then give you the, the, the arc, essentially. So we know in that record that the cell phone was somewhere within that slice of the pie, that the uh, message or the call hit that side of the tower. So we can use that to, to plot with a series of these calls and activity. We can, we can go on to plot uh, paths and disprove alibis. Sometimes we've done that before, saying, well, you couldn't have been further north on the road than this point at that time because it hit the side of the tower. Uh, so we do, we do quite a lot of mapping that way. Uh, it's quite long and laborious, but it's very useful. Um, we, there is the GPS data, as, as mentioned before. We normally get that, uh, AT&T calls it historical precision location information. Um, you'll get a, a time 
longitude and latitude, and the degree of accuracy. It can be 10,000 meters, it can be 5,000 meters. Not great for pointing out exactly where they are, but can help back up a, a, a narrative of the path. Like in this case, there was a road that, that was being driven along there, and that backs it up. This That is protected, um, uh, protected content and is available for about six months, but you need a search warrant. So criminal defense, people normally get it as part of discovery from law enforcement um, if they're lucky enough. And uh, so, so we have seen that before. Privacy issues. Yeah, if we want to, I want to move on to this real quick to make sure we fit this in. Um, resistance to extraction, large amount, uh, large majority of time, it's because adult images are on the phone. Uh, unfortunately, that's, that's a key part of, of what people store on their cell phones sometimes. Um, private conversations, especially uh, litigation when uh, due with employment. Um, and so mistrust of giving too much information, uh, dating apps and things that could be used as character assassination. Um, selective extraction, not always possible. Uh, I'll try and speed up because I know we're, we're pressed with time here. Um, n more often than not on an Android, very rare on, a, on an iPhone, uh, and you don't get deleted items. So it's not, not the best idea. Triangle agreement basically means that we will act as a third party, uh, view all the data, and just apply search terms that have been agreed by the two parties and have both parties um, agree to the data produced, essentially. Um, and that's something that we, we 80% of the time we have. Um, this one, I'll just give you the name and let you look it up um, yourself. Um, it's very important. Um, I'll go through it a little bit. It's Garcia versus City of Laredo. Um, it, it's a case where a dispatcher was having an affair with a, a police officer at the station. Um, the wife searched the locker, found Garcia's cell phone, looked through the cell phone and found uh, images and text messages, took it to her supervisor, who then conducted an investigation into, um, what was in, into the cell phone, and then um, she, she was fired for... Uh, sexual activity while whilst on duty. So obviously she felt that her privacy was invaded, that it was um, not a valid search. And it's actually quite interesting case law that, that governed this. They said that um, the actual cell phone was in the officer's unlocked locker. That, that was a key point there. Um, that Garcia was aware of the possibility that the officer's wife may find the cell phone. Um, that was a key point they made that she was aware of the uh, possibility that the wife would find it but did not lock it with a passcode or keep it within her own locker. So that made that private search um, admissible. They were allowed to do that. That was not a violation of privacy. Now the supervisor's search, this is a key case that you might want to look into, United States versus Runyon, basically said that the private searcher, um, because the private searcher had searched the cell phone, it meant that the supervisors could do a more detailed search of that same digital data container, which they determined was a cell phone, is one container of data. If it's been searched privately, then uh, officially it can have a more detailed search of the same container uh, without viola a violation of privacy. And that, that's what they found. Um, she then challenged it, uh, saying that it, was, it violated the Store Communications Act which was an act that was brought in because of internet service providers and the Fourth Amendment not covering that expectation of privacy when giving data, essentially you hand over your data to a third party um, and, and covering that new expectation of privacy that they had. So they brought in the Stored Communications Act to counter that, um, which is why you need the search warrant for the uh, GPS data. Uh, but she argued that a cell phone w was covered by that, but it, it wasn't a facility protected by the SCA. Um, I'll skip through these very quickly. Other things we can do, we can connect directly to the chip in what's called JTAG to bypass it to get the data. We can take the chip off the, the board. Some risk of damage, so it's not always possible, but uh, it, c it can help us get that extraction. This is a, what a text message looks like in hexadecimal, so we did a little bit of carving through the raw data and found a text message that said, and a lick to. 
that relates to uh, the sexual harassment investigation, uh, we were able to find a message that the lady had sent to her supervisor that countered her, her testimony. Um, this is what I was able to break down to prove it wasn't from the supervisor, it was from the subordinate. Um, we can look at Snapchat safe pics, um, all these different areas that we, we can also look at there. Um, what I, I want to leave time for um, some questions. So I'm going to skip over this very quickly. Just that in a, with this slide, definitely download the slides, have a look at this. Filling out the details of maybe homicide with all these smart devices mean that traces are left and a better picture of what happened will be possible. Um, cloud entity was, is another trend that will be very damaging to forensic science because people now pick their kind of their tribe, whether it's Google, Apple, or Alexa, and pretty soon nothing will be stored on the device. You'll just essentially log into the servers and um, all the data will be stored there. And we see that now if you look at the Pixels commercials uh, out there at the moment, they're saying never see this screen again, you unlimited storage. That's because they're already starting to to store all the data up there on Google Drive. So um, that's a worrying trend because soon there will be no actual artifacts on the devices, these mobile devices for us to find if it keeps going that way. Okay, so I apologize for skipping over a few at the end there, but I think we got the most important ones in there and I, I want to leave time for some questions. Thank you. We're entering the final Q&A. Please enter the passcode now. The passcode is cell phone. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question, which uh, is, is uh, Apple the most secure of devices in terms of trying to hack into? Um, yes. <laughs> they are problematic in many ways to us. Um, yeah, very difficult because the operating system is not made public. Um, and the Android operating system is, is um, available. Anyone can see how it works, how it how it functions, and, and they're in right um, codes to, to get into it and to exploit uh, and bypass security. Um, but it's not public, the Apple operating system. So it's very hard to bypass, very hard for us to bypass it and hack into it to get the forensic data. Um, they're very thorough if you do a, an erase, um, you know, a reset of the Apple device. That's pretty much all the data gone. It's very thorough. Um, and then, you know, there's nothing we can do. So, yeah, Apple is definitely the most secure. Thank you. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded to Simon, and he will answer them directly. Please remember that if you are applying for CLE credit, you must attend, have attended for the full 60 minutes of the presentation. You are also required to complete the survey at the end of the program. Please note, you will be receiving your certificates via email in 24 to 48 hours after the presentation. In addition to being your best source for testifying and consulting experts for more than 60 years, TAS also offers free interactive webinars, expert written articles, research reports on expert witnesses, including the Challenge History Report 2.0, and the Expert Profile 360. I want to take this opportunity to thank everyone for attending, and most especially Simon Varley, for his time and effort in creating this presentation. If you would like to speak with Simon or if you would like to speak with a TAS representative regarding an expert witness for a case that you are working on, please contact TAS at 1-800-523-2319. One of my colleagues will be following up with you regarding your feedback on today's presentation. This concludes our program for today.